Hey everyone, it's Sarah here from Equestrian Movement and guess what? I've managed to bring along Katie from Equestrian Movement. Hey Katie. Hi. Um, so it's been a long time since uh, uh, we've done these Stronger Bond workshops and Katie's told me that she's had some fear of missing out because she forgets how much she enjoys doing them when we get the chance. So she's really excited that we can um, get together tonight and uh, actually, she's actually got the chance to participate beyond those uh, her school lessons tonight, which is really, really cool. Now, I'm just checking that our session's coming up into the Stronger Bond workshop, so hopefully it is working. don't know if you've seen it on your phone yet, Katie. Yeah, it's coming up on my phone. Yay! Here Hi, we are. <laughs> Whoop! Uh, and there it's just repeating on me. Um, that's too fun. <laughs> so hey if you're watching let us know that you're here that you can hear us that um, we're streaming successfully because we're using a little bit of different tech um, you may get asked to um, give permission for your name to show so that it shows up in our stream um, if you haven't or if you've skipped past no don't worry too much we've got the comments coming up on our Facebook page too so we can hopefully um, see it coming through but this just allows us to get on together and uh, have a bit of a natter um, tonight's session is one of our exciting ones because we've been leading up over the last two sessions talking about the conflicts that we've been experiencing and the concern that sort of um, dry or like is driven by our own internal thought processes and experiences. But now we're going to like tonight's session um, is a good one because we're going to focus on the actual, um, you know, what we do next and why we do it. Um, so you guys can start making a huge head away in your connection there. Uh, excellent. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Jenny. Thanks for joining us. I can see your comments popping up. Hey, Pam. Woohoo! We are working. We are live. We are functioning, Katie. Hey. <laughs> I think you're still watching the Facebook just to check that it's coming up live, aren't you? I'm also commenting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Pam. Hi, Tanya. <laughs> See, I told you, FOMO. Um, <laughs> uh, so for those of you guys, just as everybody's um, jumping back on, this is tonight, it's the last session. Um, and, uh, well, sorry, it is actually going to be the last session. And one thing that Katie and I forgot to do today is to confirm that we're going to be doing a Q&A. Well, I think that I would like to do a Q&A, but we just haven't. Um, discuss times and it's easy. Yeah. Here, so. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, Katie and I will jump off um, tonight and we'll confirm if when if slash when the Q and A will happen and what time it will go live and let you guys know. Um, but we have run uh, two other sessions previously uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday night. If you miss those and you want to catch the replays. Just let us know if you need a hand with tagging them, but they are inside the Stronger Bond community, so you can watch them there. Um, they will stay up in the um, Stronger Bond community only until Sunday of next week, which I, um, which is the 24th of April. And we do take them down so that we can concentrate on um, like some of our student questions, but also because we do have a tendency to go on a bit of a tangent when we have these workshops and sometimes we're not 100% um session with regards to um uh, with regards to what we were speaking we don't ever want to put you on the um <laughs> on the wrong track thanks Pam we, yeah epic Q and A's like Katie is awesome at the Q and A's going deeper into some of the questions and experiences you've got um so if you do have some of those particularly tricky ones and I think there's been a couple that have come through um so far I think um, it's a great session to watch and even just listen into, even if you're not experiencing them, because you can pick up a few hints and tips um, on the way. Um, also tonight, we are announcing the winners of our um, live session giveaways. Uh, so that's uh, two giveaways that we're doing, which is um, two, two free access passes to our opening communication mini course, which is a great starting point for a lot of you guys um, that are trying to build some connection and just trying to look for I guess, um, you know, to understand really what you want to um, look. And it's a great little test and learn. So it's one of our favourite mini courses. It's where majority of our students start off on. We do have um, in our holistic course handling program, we do have a small tangent for, I guess, our more aggressive and um, 
uh, traumatized horses where they just need a little bit of a slightly more specialized approach where we um, it just, I guess, deviates slightly from where most horses might take it. But at the same time, also, um, we're always working with the horse that we have and we're not always saying do step A, do step B, do step C, and this is what you get. It's always working with those um, horses in a particular way. So opening communications is one of those really cool um a really great course for you guys to get started on. So at the end of this session, we'll announce the winners of those um, prizes. So definitely stay tuned. And what I might do now, though, is because it's been a while since Katie's jumped on live, I know that there's a number of new students, uh, sorry, new people who've jumped into the Stronger Bond community. I reckon it's time that Katie um, int actually introduces herself so you know who she actually is. <laughs> so take it away. Hey guys, my name is Katie. I am the head coach at Equestrian Movement and I'm so excited to be here with you. I definitely have had FOMO the last two nights <laughs> watching Sarah host and not getting to like jump in and chat with you all. I have been loving all of our students coming in and doing this again with us though. I think you can appreciate how the trajectory keeps shifting as our approach <laughs> refines and we practice what we preach. So um, Sarah and I started this three years ago, four years ago now, <laughs> uh, online prior to that. Um, I had just been you know, working in a writing school for nine years and um, then went out teaching people on their own horses at their properties and in the last two years now I've been running the riding school as well so um, I have a history of very like drill competitive training um, you know we used to do the show circuit and states and all of that kind of thing but I also had a horse that had come off the rodeo circuit we didn't know that when we bought him he um, was sold to us as a show horse for me to go out and compete on and we just had a plethora of problems with him um, only to recognize like our first trip out took us a year to even you know get out to our first show because he was so difficult I think is probably the most polite way to put it <laughs> um and we went out to that first comp and they're like oh he's off the radio circuit and we're like hmm we paid a lot of money for a bucked out bronco <laughs> to be taking on the show circuit so he had all sorts of problems and when I look back now like they're all the signs of horses that have experienced severe trauma and abuse um we couldn't tie him up I couldn't catch him. I have vivid memories of him dragging my granddad down the alleyway because um, he refused to let go because he don't let go of a bolting horse. Uh, he used to buck me off every time I rode him. He's very good at getting me to land on my back so I was winded and I would think I was dying and then I'd have to get back up and hop back on. <laughs> um, so he was like really that first horse that, um, you know, I experienced what people could do to the mental health of an animal. And I didn't really do any natural horsemanship or any join up or anything like that with him. But after, you know, a period of time of us work together, he learned to trust me and have faith and confidence in me. And he would just follow me everywhere I went. We, I'd put the tack away because I couldn't tie him up. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd go to put the pack away and he'd follow me and I'd go to, you know, fuss around with his feet and he'd follow me. And so we basically had that connection that you get from join up, but just from working together, getting to know each other, building a language and communication and making him feel safe. So he really kind of opened my eyes to the potential, I guess, but I didn't really understand it at the time until I started working at the school. And then the opportunity of working with so many different horses helps you understand that there's like a language that makes sense across all horses. And you just have to like adapt slightly to suit their personality and, you know, who they are and, and whatnot. And that, that language is like 
horse mannerisms and horse behaviors we kind of take that and cue it to create a deeper language where we can communicate what we want and they can communicate what they want and so we, we develop like these, these weird little things like our fist bump where we can have a language between each other and we try and ex extrapolate on that. So I tend to um, attract the big behaviours, the big dangerous horses, you know, the, the problem horses, like um, people's last ditch effort before giving up on their horses um, because really like when our horses get to that stage of the big behaviours, all they need is to be heard. And what it is they need us to hear is very dependent on the horse and what they're experiencing. We've had horses like in severe pain. We've had one horse that had a fractured neck that we the owner didn't know about. And, you know, when we see the behaviours continue and it should have resolved, we dig further. Um, you know, we've seen all sorts of things um that you know that there, there is a reason sometimes the reason isn't great but there is a reason behind these behaviors and and that's my job is best case scenario is we're going to dig through all of those problems and we're going to figure out why and then we're hopefully going to be able to take that through and you know move forward with the horse and best case scenario we're going to be building our beautiful unicorn relationship where we work together and enjoy each other's company because you know that that's why we do it like as a kid I was incredibly lonely <laughs> and so I used to sit on the fence with my horse with his head in, in my lap and you know I was like he was my sanctuary for that and so I always had come to them as a way of feeling good about myself and feeling positive and I like that's my favorite thing of teaching others is helping others find that peace within themselves that you can get when you're with horses um, but part of getting to that point where they can offer that for us we need to make sure that they feel safe secure and connected and they have trust faith and confidence in us and then we can develop psychological safety within our training so that they are happy as well <laughs> yeah and i think this has been for like for us it's been a fairly long journey of um well not a, a long journey but it's like a long a long enough journey of learning through our own experiences and then applying it and um you know using the experiences that we've seen and used with your students and um putting them together and understanding i guess a deeper way of how this all works and interacts and understanding the different personalities and how they sort of have a slightly different um interaction needs and how those personalities can actually change from those extreme behaviors that we sometimes experience when they're pushed to their limit of um, either pain, fear, um, inability to be heard or lack of confidence in in their environment and the people that are handling them and and putting that together with um, the tools and the skills that we need as people to be able to provide as well as opening up I guess that little bit of heart space and 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 showing them that we can like we do believe that they are worth all of that effort and it's really worth them um, opening their own heart to us as well so that they can um, provide a little bit of that for us at the same time so that's the goal i mean <laughs> <laughs> just look at the experiences that you've had you know the horses that you've had to work with you started with an arab mare and then you moved to a geriatric stock horse and then you moved to a thoroughbred and now you're playing with a draft horse like you have to understand the tools in the toolkit for sure but you have to understand the individual personality of the horses because you cannot treat an arab mare the same way that you treat a 17 hand draft gelding and it's not just the size <laughs> that you can't treat them that way like the arabs they're quick on their feet they're quick in their thought and they're incredibly intelligent and they're like outsmarting us before we even know what we're doing whereas the drafty is coming in for a big old cuddle and <laughs> it's hoping yeah. that all you want to do with him for the day is love on him and maybe give him some grass like they're 
we just have to appreciate that we can't treat them the same even within the same breed even within the same level of energy you know they are all very unique in their personality and so the tools are for communication and the communication is for understanding the unique personality of the horse that you're working with and then we can think about like what does it look like to motivate that horse into work and developing a work ethic yeah and I think that's the um fun thing like at least I I mean I know that I've been fairly lucky to have the experience of working with quite a number of different horses over the last few years um you know and and under your tutelage for majority of that time as well um and I think the other thing that really comes into play is is understanding our own values and we're going to talk a little bit more about this when we get into what we want but I was lucky in that I came in as an adult rider with fairly set values even if I couldn't necessarily express them um but you know as far as I was concerned the, the one top priority that came um with me working with horses is that I wanted my horse to enjoy working with me just as much as I enjoyed working with them um you know, and then, of course, it extrapolates into um, love, trust, faith, connection, all of those types of things. And, and I think a lot of that had a lot to do with my own veterinary nursing and background. Um, but I also know that there's a number of um, people that have commented, like a number of um, the audience that have commented that have talked about their previous experience um, growing up in a similar situation to your own, where it was kind of like a push them through it. Uh, this is exactly the way that you work every single horse and no other horse has a different personality and then boom this you know that we're in this situation now where maybe we've taken a break or we've um met a new horse that's really challenged the skill sets that we've had and we go hang on this just isn't the way that it needs to be yeah so. for sure that was king for me but even you know tonight i have this problem right like you guys that uh have been doing our courses and our programs with us would pretty probably appreciate this but i have um you know students coming through to the school that learn to ride at other riding schools on horses that are completely like brain dead <laughs> I don't know if there's any other way you can really put it like they've just been taught to ignore they've been pushed through to the point where they don't do anything other than bum to tail follow the leader in front and so we I have this problem where I have students coming from other riding schools that can sit on a horse but they don't know how to actually communicate with the horse and you know work together and so I have a new rider tonight and She's come in from a riding school and she's a competent rider and she hops on Rabbit and asks Rabbit to go. And it was like, you can tell she's been riding school horses because it was like a fair wallop that got Rabbit very upset and highly strung over. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was so wound up that then she couldn't find his brakes. And so this is, you know, why how we end up in that situation of just being completely like ignorant to our horse's needs and just pushing them through it is a lot of us start at riding schools where our horses are just you know they have to be ignorant like if you think about how much they have to ignore to start a beginner rider you can't have that level of sensitivity where they're tuned in and connected and still tolerant of a beginner rider so it we worked through it right we talked about like what she needed to do to listen and how she needed to soften her aids off and have like a two-way conversation and she got it but she was just so upset with who she had to be in the first place who have ridden the other school horses and you know that was where I personally had got with my riding career was like you know what the coaches what my coaches and trainers were telling me to do to be successful in this industry just didn't sit well with me I couldn't treat the horses that way and it's because like those of you that are here with us are here because you're sensitive as well like you're aware you're tuned in you know that this isn't what you should have to do to an animal for it to work with you and so as soon as she like remembered oh like there's a place where we can be together in this then you know everything kind of balanced and balanced out with each other where the the pitch and the tone of the aid 
was appropriate to the horse and the horse's needs to cooperate. And, you know, this is like what you've learned isn't wrong. You know, you these tools are important. We still use them. It's just the part that gets missed is listening to the horse and meeting them where they're at and supporting them in finding, you know, their, their way forward with us. And the horses that don't get that, they do get the big behaviours because the only way they have to communicate the fact that, you know, what we're doing to them isn't appropriate is to escalate in behaviour. It's the only option that we have, they have for us. If we yeah. listen, if they feel heard, then they don't have to get into self-protect mode, defence mode, and just try and protect themselves from us. They feel threatened by us. Yeah, which I think um, when it comes down to it in a grand scheme, it's why um, when we uh, look at horse handling as a whole and and we call it holistic horse handling because we look at the physical and mental um, capabilities and learning learnability of the horse, but at the same time we also look at that emotional agility um, for the horse and there's three key pillars and I think this one is uh, what we're talking about right now really encompasses um, our number one, which is our um, first um, answer to the circle on the um, she sheet on your workbook, which, by the way, I forgot to mention, is um, <laughs> you should, guys should have that by now on page three. But it's compassionate leadership. So that first circle, it's all about compassionate leadership. And in compassionate leadership, we talk about um, uh, the first do no harm. So you're understanding our values, but also understanding our horse and working with the unique horse we have, um, looking at um, building, um, using our tools as part of a communication, but also allowing our horse to communicate to us what they need. And of course, um, then the connection, you know, asking for that level of connection, which I think is where we really want to be with our horses. Right, Katie? Oh, for sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I we talk a lot about me and Fiddy because we have had a tumultuous relationship <laughs> and um my big thing that I take in with him is my resting bitch face and my frustration and he just don't like it but it's the you know the same friction that I bring into every relationship that I'm in as soon as I get stressed so it's not only a missing piece of connection with my horse, it's like a missing piece of connection that I have with every relationship that I'm in. Yeah. And I think uh, that was a huge eye-opener for you because you ob obviously Fiddy had to tell you in big, loud words at some stage that he wasn't really happy with the way you were <laughs> you were taking that approach. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps it started with him losing a bit of confidence um, with um, uh, you know multiple factors, you know, such as um, losing King, relocating, um, you know, and then being handled by your partner while you were pregnant because you couldn't do that the handling, and and he lost all confidence in the entire environment, and then just went, "Nut, nah, you're the blame," <laughs> <laughs> and don't bring that attitude to me. <laughs> 100% and it's just even in the process of becoming a mum like losing confidence in your body losing confidence in how quickly you can move around and get yourself into a safe position you know figuring out the so the way that I've always got myself onto the horses that are the big dangerous ones that have the big bad problems is by saying if I die today I die happy and so just that like emotional shift that this could go pear-shaped and it could go bad, but I'm going to be doing it, doing what I love. I could hurt myself. You know, I've had a student that broke her ankle walking on tiles and heels. And so we can have the same accidents just doing simple things like Sarah blew her back out by sneezing. <laughs> so we can and, and injure I just ourselves. Want, I just want anything flat in flat shoes so <laughs> <laughs> so that used to be the way that I got the confidence to get onto them but now like you know when you have a family and you have children you have to have that responsibility that if you get hurt it impacts them so like just even working through that in my brain has changed who I am as a horse rider and handler as well yeah 
Yeah. And I think that's where it comes down to like really showing up as that compassionate leader and working with the horse that we have with their unique needs and their unique personality, allowing that two way communication to come through. And then, of course, um, you know, building on that level of connection so that you can, um, I guess, translate a lot of that communication into what is what they are really feeling but at the same time open them to the possibility of connecting to us so that they want to start to look and look after us and partner with us as well which um mm. sort of you know and it's and it's intrinsically entwined and that's why we've got and forgive me because I can never remember the name of this particular um you know three circled graph but you know that's why it works like that it's the you know compassionate leadership leads into um both faith and trust and we use other skill sets in those sides to build that up and then when we get all three intersecting that's when we build that psychological safety which is where we find that powerfully connected equestrian team where we both appreciate each other we both work together to um i guess uh you know <laughs> to and I don't want to say compensate but to I guess um, support each other where our gaps are but at the same time grow with each other and look after each other and develop that deep deeper level of connection and um, affection for each other at the same time so um so that first circle that we're talking about that's the compassionate leader and it encompasses our first do no harm philosophy which uh, uh which is about um you know, under working with the horse that we have today, knowing your values, uh, ruling out um, pain and other causes of potential harm before you actually start fully working on behaviour as a pro, like, you know, blaming it as a behavioural problem. Um, that communication, opening the two-way street communication and connection. Those are the three pillars of our um, compassionate leadership, which is just one circle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I think that uh, you guys can appreciate that we've worked a lot on this over the last couple of years. Um, it definitely didn't start out like this. And and there is a lot of words, the words are just describing our values. These values are here because of real biological functions, real hormones, real neurotransmitters, real parts of the brain that are being fired by the way we work with our horses. If we want to make an 800 kilo flight animal want to look after us, we have to be friends with it first. <laughs> we, can, we can push, bully, submit, pressure, punish create aversives you know move them away from the thing that they don't want be bigger about a scarier than what they're scared of but at the end of the day none of those things actually make the horse like us or actually make the horse want to look after us and that was the part that I couldn't take anymore as a trainer myself and as a rider and that was the part where I was like I'm either quitting or I'm figuring this out <laughs> and so yeah we have um we have been figuring it out <laughs> and what, what we're looking at as, as like a compassionate leader, what we term as a compassionate leader is the first thing is we're ruling out pain. If we've got a horse that's expressing a problem through behaviors and the other thing that we have to remember is that um, our behaviors are emotional responses from our horse. Our horse can't control its behaviors if it can't control its emotions what is firing those emotions that's creating those behaviors and that's where like the horse industry is a little bit distracted by behaviors like fix this behavior fix that behavior like band-aid 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 we still have the core problem the horse just doesn't feel safe to express it and it's going to come out in another problem and another problem and another problem and another problem. And the reason why it's so hard to get to that core problem is it's very hard to create a safe, secure and connected horse that has had, you know, a poor weaning process that's been moved from home to home to home to home that hasn't created a relationship with a human whose, um, you know, main experience of being handled by humans has been punishment, um, stable 24-7, only out to um, train like our thoroughbreds. They don't get the social interactions with each other. So it's very hard to create a safe, secure and connected 
course in our current industry as well. So um, circling back around from all of that is that the compassionate leader first has to make sure that their horse isn't in pain. They're trying to express something through behaviours. We have to make sure first that it's not pain related. And then what we're looking at is fear. So if our horse is being triggered into the fight, flight, freeze part of their brain in the training process, they can't learn properly. They can only react and respond so if we you know we don't even have to be using you know severe tools or aversive or punishing them our horses are scared of us because they are prey animals and we're predators and I walk in with my resting bitch face and they're like oh hell no girl we won't be eaten today (laughs) so we have to remember that just our presence is a stress If they don't feel safe, relax around us. They don't feel safe to fall asleep around us. If they don't feel safe to communicate to us, we can already be firing the fact that they feel threatened and that they've gone into their survival mode where they're in fight, flight, or freeze. And it's literally a different section of their brain that does not work with relaxation and it does not work with problem solving, memory retention, it's just like a wiring process. So if we are wiring in a flight response, you know, a fight response to every training environment that we do with our horse, then we're hardwiring them to be reactive. And all of the times that we, you know, are taught to push our horse through it and to show them who's boss, like we are creating the friction. We are creating the fight because we're not starting at that point of relaxation. We're not starting at that point of safe, secure, and connected. We are not showing up as compassionate leaderships. We're, as leaders, we're just um, showing up as power over leaders. And for a lot of you, that does not sit well with you. And so that's why you're here with us looking for a different way of doing things. And once we have like ruled out pain, we've ruled out fear, we are going to be putting stress on our horse. The stress is the stress of learning, you know, physical stress. We have to have an awareness of how we are using stress in a positive way that helps our horses grow and mature and develop emotional resilience uh, and not in a way that they have to, you know, become defenses, defensive over. So if we, like create too much um, physical strain, stress, then we're going to have muscle injuries that we have to manage. If we create too much emotional stress, then we have flighty animals that can't control themselves. If we create too much mental stress, then we're going to have shut down horses or that are just so completely confused and overwhelmed that we end up with emotional problems anyway. So it's really about being strategic and intentional about your training scenarios And then that's, again, when we're looking at the unique personality of the horse, the stress that we're going to put on the draft horse is different to the stress that we're going to put on the young stock horse mare. It's going to be different to the stress that we put on the Arab mare and how we progress them. We were sharing, um, you know, one of the training sessions that I did with Breaking Little Sally in, and she was at the backing point, but I was a bit, we're not, I'm not quite there. Like I don't want to sit on her just yet because the relationship isn't strong enough. So we changed the stressor and we did in-hand adventures and confidence through curiosity. And so she had to, you know, put more trust, faith and confidence in me to go and do this more challenging thing. So it meant that she was more prepared to actually be backed. And that's that's what we're talking about with psychological safety is like being able to hear our horses tell us, hey, I'm not ready for this challenge yet. But you can think strategically, create a different set of scenarios and environments that is going to prepare them appropriately so that the next time you go back into that challenge, they're a little bit more ready and you can still hear them say, hey, I'm still not quite ready. And then we take them out and we go back in and we go out. Then that's what we call our adjustable goalposts. Absolutely. And I think, you know, um, so that is a very brief understanding of, I guess, um, compassionate leadership. And I shouldn't say it's very brief because it is complex, but it does, um, 
you know, you know, that is why it's one of the first um, pillars that we actually have in that entire philosophy about how we can work to develop that connection. When we start to show up as that compassionate leader, when we um, know that we've got a philosophy that applies first, you know, harm, when we know that we're working with the horse that we have um, by their personality, but also by what they're experiencing on that particular day, when we're opening those lines of communication and we're asking for connection, um, that is what encompasses our compassionate leadership um, with our horses. But now I'm going to jump not to number two, but in fact to number three, because um, we've spoken just about that one a little bit better, which is around emotional agility. Um, so the, uh, of course, um, helping our horses develop a bit of emotional agility allows them to, um, I guess, express some of those behaviours in less louder words, but also to become more confident in, them, uh, confident in themselves and us at the same time while we're working together as we start to build up on the next pillar, which I'll talk about in a minute. So when it comes to emotional agility, we're looking at um, relaxation, helping to cue our horses to relax, uh, a confidence development through curiosity and also helping them to develop a secure attachment. So do you want to elaborate a little bit on those? You did mention a couple of them already, but I know they're your jam. <laughs> yeah. Emotional agility is like my favourite thing to talk about, not necessarily my favourite thing to do when I'm in the moment. I'm like, <laughs> emotional agility, emotional agility. <laughs> but I do uh, enjoy talking about You're talking about, about yourself there, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we're talking about when we are working on emotional agility, we have already been having this conversation over the last couple of days is like we don't do traditional desensitization in the way that it's normally taught. So if we think about, you know, the area of the brain that is triggered for um you know, survival and for self-protection and defense, we're in the fight, flight or freeze part of the brain. Um, just telling a horse to stand still while we desensitize them doesn't take them out of that part of the brain. It just gets, it conditions them that freeze is the option to choose when they're scared. So perfect, right? We've fixed our flight animal. It no, it no longer runs when it's scared. It now freezes when it's scared. And then we wonder why we have horses that nap and that jack up when they don't, when they're scared, like they're, they're worried about what's going to happen. It's because we're conditioning freeze into our horses when they're scared through desensitization. So what we are wanting to do, the way that we teach desensitization is the emotional agility process of being able to shift the horse out of the part of the brain that is fired for self-protect, um, the fight, flies, fight, flight, or freeze part of the brain, and shift them into other areas of the brain where they can process the stimulus. So um, our confidence through curiosity, you might have seen the comment that I put in um, on the first day of training is that it's hard to be scared and curious at the same time because they're different parts of the brain that don't fire at the same time so if you're feeling fear and you get curious about your fear then you're actually going to start rewiring your fear into curiosity and curiosity is a much more friendly emotion to deal with than fear and <laughs> panic <laughs> most of the time I think Pam will um, comment that there <laughs> may have been one time when curiosity nearly got the Stella but <laughs> <laughs> yeah so then yeah, obviously easier to manage we have on. the problems with the horses being about the curious about the things that they need to actually be scared of but you know we we um hope that they learn some skills there and what they should be curious about and what they should be a little bit yeah. about. And, and that's where the partnering I guess in the emotional agility comes to that compassionate leadership where we're we're asking them to connect with us and trust us as a leader that they can follow so that um, when they're looking to be curious, they're looking to us to confirm that they should be curious or that it's safe to be curious. Um, you know, and, you know, in the case of poor Stella, you know, it was so well taught that she developed a lot of self-confidence and unfortunately was curious with the porcupine. But <laughs> um, Sorry, Stella. Sure after that, she, she did learn that porcupines were not things to be curious about. And we got to the other 
but um, and she's and still in a lovely connected way um, that didn't interfere with our relationship connection or even her self confidence, which is important. Yeah, yeah. So we're looking, <laughs> um, moving them out of the part of the brain where they are reacting to their stimulus and they're either reacting through fight, flight or freeze and we're shifting them into different emotional states. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to create those different emotional states. So the way we start this is through our relaxation process and our horses are just so amazing at showing us this. Like I don't think that there's any other animal that shows it the way that they do. When they are in a heightened state, they lock their jaw and they lock their mouth shut because that's what they, it all locks shut for them to run away to escape. And so when they start coming out of this place into um, the, uh, like into relaxation, into rest and digest, the first thing that we see is the whiskers start to twitch and then the nerves up their mouth, up the sides of their cheeks start to twitch and fire and then they we see the act of licking and chewing when they start to salivate so that's starting to come into rest and digest we might also see them rubbing their nose on their leg lowering their head um you know we get called it's like a sign of submission when their head comes down but really it's like trust that we are going to protect them from threats in their environment their head comes lower than their wither and it relaxes they shake the tension out of their ears you'll see them gently swish their tail to shake the tension out of their tail um, so we're seeing these active signs of them coming out of more of a self-protect and self um, and survival mode and into a relaxation mode that relaxation is saying I trust you to make good choices for me I trust you to protect me I trust you to keep an eye on my environment while I relax I trust you to fall asleep around me and if we think about connection with horses this is so important to them because if we have a horse in a paddock by itself it can't relax it can't sleep because they're so vulnerable they need to have their paddock or herd mate to you know keep an eye on them while they relax and go to sleep so if we can be that person for them then they trust us not only not to be the threat but also to protect them from other threats so you can see where this emotional ability it starts to layer into other things we start to build trust faith and confidence they start to feel safe to relax and sleep around us and so we can condition those relaxation cues into them um, and the process of relaxing itself feels good to them so they're going to choose relaxation more often and then what we're going to try and do is we're going to shape that relaxation into work ethic to the best of our ability and so work ethic is still kind of like high energy but it's not for fear of threat. They're not responding for threat, fear of punishment or threat or what's going to happen to them. We're looking for ways that their unique personality is motivated into work by and we're taking them there. And then even like, you know, our horses that have a positive work ethic and have good relaxation skills, they start to become people pleasers and they start to get a little bit anxious and nervous in whether they've done the right thing. And so then what we're going to do is we're going to toggle is we're going to bring them down into relaxation and then we're going to bring them back up into work and down into relaxation until we have relaxed focus when we're working. Um, and that's not the only way that we can use emotional agility. Like we're going to be firing some dopamine for a task achievement, which gets them excited about being on our team and joining in with what we're doing. We're going to have some oxytocin going from getting the softening and getting that relationship and the connection and the bond. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to create like happy hormone releases within our training session with what is actually making them enjoy <laughs> us being with them and us working with them um, and then we have a horse that enjoys working enjoys learning us to be ridden and you know he sees us coming and sings out to us and runs up to meet us at the gate that's like you know the ideal scenario that we're all looking for is this the horse that actually wants us to ride them and so if we're creating you know, if we're aware of how we can fire these happy hormones on top of each other and we can create a horse that knows 
and in ourselves the awareness like just the subtleties of the tension that can start to build when we know what relaxation looks like and how deep it can go you'll see it just in like the wrinkle of your horse's nose or just in the twitch of their ear or in the tension of their tail and that is like that horse's way of communicating tension or they're not happy to you and if you can catch it at that point then they don't need the big behavior to communicate that to you in the first place and we're not firing the fight flight or freeze in our horses that have experienced trauma there is like a completely different wiring of their brain so the horses that we have you know that like raffi and phoenix and angel you know they they haven't known trauma they've been they live on the same property they were born on they've had good lives they've had good handlers like the worst experience they've had is being loved and you know back to ride they've and they're so different to work with than you know like Zodi who goes he shows us very clear trauma um like behaviors with the way that he responds in that lack of trust in people it's not just even like the the lack of trust is so strong that he's never going to put himself in a situation that he can't escape. So these horses, they're always looking for the out. And if there is no out around you, the out is over you. And their their brains are wired differently because they are just so like hardwired into protecting themselves. And we can do the emotional agility work with them and we can rewire them. It does take a lot longer because we have to really show up for them. We have to really be somebody to them that they know that they can trust because they know how bad humans can be. And so the emotional agility works in rewiring the brain and in in rewiring the hormone release and in rewiring the neurotransmitters. And if we pay attention to it and we do it well, then we know when our horse is unhappy and we can create happy experience, unhappy experience, unhappy experience. (laughs) I have to say, like, um, we talk a lot about emotional agility in the horses and I think that's one of the huge things that tends to be missing in a lot of um, training. Like, uh, a lot of that emotional agility is either to, to, uh, like, to put them into that freeze mode where they're not reactive or, um, you know, it's totally ignored and they just get ended up... um, you know, either being classified as dangerous or, or totally shut down and, and moved along or told that they're just not the right horse for you. But in reality, they just haven't learned that emotional agility um, in there. And that's not to say that sometimes, you know, a uh, green person with a very traumatised horse isn't necessarily the best match, but sometimes they can be great matches in that the personalities and the willingness to work together and to use some of those um, cues to develop those emotional agilities and the desire to create a horse that um, is safe and wants to be with us is probably a lot um, fresher. And it's just a case of making sure we know that those skills, uh, you know, what skill sets we need to just start to develop, even if we haven't had a lot of practice at doing it, is just to know the pathway to move through it. But the um, other thing about emotional agility that I think is really important uh, is around the idea that when we're cueing or when we're training this emotional agility into our horses, it's quite funny because we start to cue some of that into ourselves as well. Um, so we think about curiosity um, in our horses and when we're a little bit curious, um, when we're teaching our horses to be a little bit curious, we're a little bit curious ourselves and we're starting to build more confidence because that fear and curiosity can't live in that same sl- same pace uh, place. Uh, when we're um, using our relaxation cueing, more often than not, we are going to actually relax ourselves because we can't cue relaxation without developing some level of relaxation ourselves. If we're highly tense and strong and we're telling our horse to calm down, <laughs> chances are they're not going to listen, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's really nice that um, while we're working on this, um, particularly um when you know when I've gone through some of my confidence issues and when I'm starting to become more anxious in the saddle um or even occasionally fearful I would just resort to the cue training um for relaxation that you had instilled in me which is the breathing exercises and helping my horse breathe with me and and uh knowing a few extra tips to make sure are you are you listening are you talking to me uh you know 
do we have some level of connection and feel of one another? Yep, that's good. Okay, so the, re- the tension is probably coming from me. Let's both relax together and make sure it's happening. Yep, we're going, doing good. And that is a huge confidence builder in itself, um, particularly like from my perspective as a student moving forward and developing as a trainer as well. So, but of course, the emotional agility, um, without the emotional agility, we really can't have that willingness either. We can't really develop that work ethic that we're talking about, which is the willingness. Um, So I'm just going to pop the new banner up there so you guys see the answers because we do talk about this a little bit um, more. So this is the answer to the the second circle, which is willingness. And in that we talk about um, helping our horses to learn to learn. So taking them out of that reactive space and into a learning brain and then teaching them how to learn, uh, which I think is one thing that's often missed in a lot of like it's assumed that horses can do things as opposed to that they need to learn to do things and then looking at consent and choice as well as part of that development of willingness to develop that engagement and desire to work together so yeah for sure I mean if you look at what is expected of a breaker you should um you know people pay a lot of money to get their horses broken in and they expect to have a horse back that can walk trot and canter turn um go out on trail rides go out and compete like there is a lot expected of breakers so you're going to use the quickest route possible to get the behaviors that are being like the horse is being sent to you for that doesn't mean that the horse understands why they're giving them to you it doesn't mean that the horse is confident in its answers it doesn't mean that the horse knows how to find answers next time it's asked something so learning to learn is definitely a huge gap in a lot of horses um experiences because they're just kind of pressured into a behavior and they have to figure it out a little bit for themselves it's it is it is um you know a lot of horses don't and it's us as well right it's again we're gonna we're gonna learn how to ride in a riding school environment where you just have to push and bully the horse into work when it comes to um you know, working with horses that aren't school horses and we try and do that to them, we don't know how to time the release of the aid. So the cueing is actually really easy, like developing the language and the communication is really easy. You need to figure out how you're going to guide the horse into the behaviour. You need to figure out how you're going to mark that behaviour and then you're going to figure out how you're going to motivate your horse to give you that behaviour again. And if you can do this, your horse can develop language between you and your horse. The difficult bit is all of the behavioural stuff and the behavioural stuff and the cueing get like lumped into one, like the personality of the horse, the friction between the horse and the handler and the cue all get lumped into one. So when we're doing... Um, you know, at the school, we do our groundwork. We have to do, we have to do, I make the, everybody do, you know, half hour of groundwork before they ride. One of the things that we do do is clicker training. And the one thing that everybody says is like, oh, my God, it's so easy to teach a horse a behavior. It's like, yes, the cueing is easy. The communication is easy. But if you're trying to, like, push a horse into a behavior and fight a horse into behavior, then you're not cueing, you're, you know, antagonizing them to respond in a way where they feel threatened. And so you're dealing with a horse that is feeling threatened. And so you're having to manage behaviors that are expressing the feeling of threat. And so that's not cueing, that's not the communication part. It's like everything kind of getting jumbled and jumbled up and the actual language being unclear because we're trying to battle them into submission at the same time and so that's why we really we talk about like let's just take the power battle off the table it's not about who wins or who loses it's not about the horse submitting to you it's not about you know um like winning with your horse or making sure that they give in to you every time you ask them to do something it's okay your horse said no why did it say no how do we make it yes? rule out pain rule out fear rule out stress mark the behavior motivate the behavior 
they're going to keep doing it again for you because they're going to get tricks <laughs> or they're going to get pats or they're going to get praise. And that brings us back to our emotional agility where if we get immense sense of task achievement, we get, um, you know, we're marking the behavior clearly. We understand what motivates our horse. So some horses like pats, you know, um, some horses like the vocal of good girl or like scratches in particular. And it, like, this is important. Like this is a lesson in itself that I teach is like how to pat your horse so that they like it. You know, <laughs> the patting isn't purely for us. Your horse has to like the way we touch them for it to be motivating for them to do it again. So, you know, one horse might like to be scratched under the neck, like kind of likes his ears stroke some horses like the scratch at the wither you know some of them like the stroke down the tail and the spine it's like figure out what your horse likes figure out what motivates your horse to want to be around you and use that to say you're doing an awesome job keep it up thanks for the effort and the work and so then you know, your horse is motivated to learn they enjoy learning and they ask to learn more because it pats and it feels good and the dopamine hits and all of these compounding effects where we're being super strategic and intentional about how we set our horses up for this situation so that they can actually enjoy it and so that it doesn't, you know, how many people have to experience arena sour horses or herd bound horses or just like, you know, horses that just generally don't like people. It's like, well, if we could stop pushing them and bullying them and punishing them into behaviors and start trying to communicate with them, like how much fun could that be for them? <laughs> it's a lot of fun. They actually really enjoy it. And that's where the willingness comes from. Part of it also is like if we're talking about that power battle, we do have to talk about consent and choice. So, um, <laughs> You know, when our students have done the consent training with us and the choice training with us, it can, like, everything that that horse has been pushed through comes back up. So when you take a horse that has never been allowed to say no and you let it start saying no, they start saying no to everything. And so then it's up to you. Sarah had to do this with Stormy. And we were like all the way right back to basics of uh, consent to even brush him, I think. Like, yeah. hold yeah. on. Take the, take the rug off even. Um, got, to, got to a particular point. He hated his rug going off on a cold day because he was so cold-backed and he would um, be particularly no to everything that day because he was just in discomfort. But this is part of learning our horse's preferences and learning their personality is like now you know that you have a horse that likes its rug on and likes to be warm. I have a horse that hates his rug and only wants his rug on if it's going to rain or if we're going to get a cold snap. And so have allowing your horse to have some say in what we do to them. This is the problem with the power battle, right, is like we're going in with a horse that's six to 800 kilos um, we're never going to win the power battle over physical strength and force. But the problem is, is that we have the power over everything else. We have control over where they live, how they live, who they live with, what they eat, when they eat, how they eat, vet care, what happens to them, when they work, how they work, how long they work for, how good the work feels. We have control over everything that happens to them. We So that puts us in a place of power. So even if we feel like we're not good enough, even if we feel like, you know, um, we're not strong enough or we're not competent enough or, you know, we've got too much horse or whatever it is you might be feeling, like we, we still actually are in control of everything that happens in that horse's life. And so giving them some say and some control and some power over what happens to them is a huge connector between us and them. All they need is for us to hear them and <laughs> for them to be able to say, hey, I want my rug on today because it's cold or, hey, I don't want my rug on today because it's hot or, you know, hey, like when you're taking the bridle off, 
don't let the bit smack me in the teeth. Like, you know, when, when you try to take rabbit's bridle off, he like sucks the bit so that because he hates it clanking his teeth. And so he'll, you, you can't like pull it out of his mouth. You have to hold it for him to spit it out when he's ready. So it's like when the horses feel heard and seen in, in these like, you know, really unique personality things, it's, it's not something that you can teach, right? It's like this horse doesn't like the bit hitting its teeth. And doesn't know how to open its mouth and let the bit out without it hitting its teeth. Or this horse, you know, doesn't like being brushed. So, you know, let it choose which brush it wants or, you know, whatever the personal preference of the horse is. If if we can give them the option to choose and consent different tools that we use with them. You know, we did this exercise with Sarah and Gunnar where we were doing our away from whip cues and we gave them the opportunity to target um, what do you, the hobby horse. We, I bought a hobby elephant, <laughs> um, a fairy wand, a dressage whip, a crop, and a cat toy. And, a cat toy. Yeah. and the cat toy. And he chose the dressage whip. And he had the choice of what tool he wanted used on him. And he chose the dressage whip because he, well, I'm assuming it's because he knew what the answer was to dressage whip where he hadn't had the other options like of the other tools previously. And we did the same with like Sammy the donkey and we figured out that he didn't like the feather duster. It was, the feathers were like super scary, um, but he targeted the fairy wand, but then, you know, ran and hid in the corner when he saw the dressage whip. So it's like when we think that our horses are being naughty because they're not doing what we say like we're completely missing the point they're trying to communicate you know whether they have pain whether they have fear whether they have stress and they're trying to communicate how we can motivate them how they can enjoy the process and it's when we can get to that point of how they can enjoy the process that like we do have connection and we can work really well together it's like my absolute like oh. <laughs> the moment is like being in the saddle and being like completely integrated and in movement and just that unity of like togetherness where they move with your body and your body moves with them it's just such a beautiful place we can't get there through fighting when when their body is holding tension against us and our body is holding tension against them like that's not riding that's like go and join the rodeo circuit and <laughs> if we could become a professional bronc rider yeah yeah i remember i remember the days when gunner so i remember the very first days when i used to work with gunner who um you know very low energy very low work ethic um tendency to fight um didn't fully know cues didn't fully know how to learn didn't um didn't know quite a lot of things and was very hard to motivate to actually have any type of um energy or work ethic and now you know um you know he he leans over asking me to mount so that he tries to make it easier for me to get on because he's so tall um you know he's prepping himself and bracing himself for me to get on the left side and get over to, uh, you know get onto his back and then he's like yeah okay we're good we can go ahead um you know and uh, you know, he he knows that there's some level of expectation and that um, the writing can feel good and particularly um, with cues that we've established quite some time and we check in with him and we know what his emotional motivators are, which we will talk about again a little bit later because it's one of Katie's favourite topics. But this is the thing I like about this and, you know, it, it's not just um, stuff that we do in saddle, it's all established on the ground to start with really um, we can transfer a lot of these skills into the saddle. And Charlie's actually just asked about, um, do you think there's a way of recognising where we can transfer the skills that you've learned on the ground to being in the saddle? Um, and I think there is, but it's all very dependent on the individual person and horse that we're dealing with and the skills that each of you have developed and the um, previous history that you've developed. So um, I don't know, do you want to comment any more on that one, Katie? I was actually going to ask you if you thought so, because I know my answer. Like, I definitely can. We will do 
like videos and I'll be like, oh, I missed that. Oh, I missed that. Oh, I missed that. Like, and th we, we do that on the ground as well because it's so subtle the way that they communicate that we do miss it. But if you have that communication open, if you're there as a compassionate leader, if you've developed trust, faith and confidence, if you have the psychological safety, if you miss something that was important to them, they'll just give you like a little shove and they'll be like, wait, I need this, I need attention on this. And it's not malicious. It's not, um, they're not trying to hurt you. It's a very gentle shove. Like I was saying yesterday, I think, you know, when I come in and I'm holding tension, if I'm like running late or, you know, just trying to organize a baby to get out the door is stressful. <laughs> and so I get down to the barn, I'm like, <laughs> and <laughs> things will come and he'll like shove his head into my chest and he'll be like, breathe, Katie. Oh, okay, good point. And then rabbit will like poke you in like different parts of your body just to let go of tension in certain areas or they'll like put their head around to something if they need something addressed, like if something's uncomfortable, you know, if they don't have their girth done up properly, they refuse to walk off because of the way the rider wobbles around on top. Like if they are given the psychological safety to communicate their needs without fear of punishment, they can communicate to us when we need to address things. We just have to be able to hear it. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think that's where um, all of this sort of encompasses and, and this is what we refer to as our holistic horse handling methodology, um, which we do have um, in a program and we do have students enrolling in it. In fact, it's actually open at the moment until Tuesday night. Um, but the holistic horse handling um, program sort of gives you all of those skills to continue to layer on and layer on and layer on. And then when we're ready to level up, when we're getting ready to jump in the saddle or um, increase the intensity of the ride, maybe we're maybe it's not so much that, you know, maybe we've got some really great things established in the saddle already, but the next step is to then challenge the location by exposing them to a huge big event competition where you know there's lots of horses around and lots of strange things happening and lots of cars um and you know making noise and and maybe i don't know there's a bubble machine somewhere in the distance that's about to pop bubbles on their nose um you know that's that's the next stage of leveling up and then having all of this groundwork um established prior to that and then being able to come back to those skill sets so that you can just go right well i know that this you know, this could be a big challenge for us, but that's okay because if we know that we can cue some relaxation, we can um, get some willing engagement. And I know that I'm listening to my horse and we're always communicating and, um, you know, those types of skills. It helps us with those level ups and it allows us to identify if that level up was too far a level up or if, um, if maybe, you know, we are well and truly prepared for that type of level up and we both handle it just perfectly so it's very much going to depend but i definitely think um we we see those um moments when we're ready ready to step up into a challenge into a new challenge our horse will let us particularly if we start to establish things like consent and communication our horse will let us know if it's too much for them and we will start to recognize when it's might be a little bit too much for us where our horse maybe can't look after us while we're leveling up so we just need to make sure our horse can level up to look after us while we level up to the next stage um next and then just kind of do this multi-step process in there and there's always going to be times when something comes along and and sets us back um you know i've been working on this process for quite some time with katie and you know i still step back and and katie's had the experience herself where she's had you know years and years and years and years of experience and knows this in and out like um nobody else <laughs> um and you know had to step back a few years and rethink about what um i guess you know uh, what is really going on here and how she can approach it and what are the foundations that she, you know you know and fitting it like katie knew and fitting you and how can we move past this and and that's what was the um big changer in those processes in knowing that there are going to be challenges to our skill sets there are going to be times when we do have to I guess, spiral downwards into our foundation skill sets to um, make them stronger and build up again. Um, and that's 
there is absolutely 100% nothing ever wrong with going back to those foundations, tweaking them, because we come back to them with a new set of um, eyes as well. We we know what we're looking for. You know, we, we, we take ourselves from this process of, I guess, we, we, we understand a little bit about what we're doing and we're building on top of it and then we're building on top of that and then we're building on top of that. But when we come back down, we go, oh, look, I know what it looks like up here and I'm going to solidify it down here at the bottom and then build again and build again and build again. Um, so it doesn't matter if you keep going back to foundations. The um, cool thing with going back to foundations is when you do, you level up even quicker the next time. So I do think that's a really good question. Uh, Katie, you're muted. Yeah, we're not <laughs> that, um, you know, it's easy. Like you're learning three difficult skills when you're riding. Um, you know, if you think about what it takes to learn how to ride a bike, learn how to ride a motorbike and then to challenge yourself there. And then if you think about what it takes to learn how to have a healthy functional relationship with others, like does anybody ever learn how to do that well? And then, you know, we're also learning the art of communication and understanding each other's boundaries. And then we're trying to do all three of them at the same time. And, and then we're trying to sit on the horse. Um, so it's not easy but you can do it the traditional way which is where I did it with King and you can um get thrown onto your back and get winded and get back on and thrown onto your back and get winded and get back on and thrown onto your back and get winded and get back on or <laughs> you can listen to them about why they're trying to throw you off in the first place um and you know when Roll out pain, and when we keep them from feeling threatened by us, and we can develop, um, you know, we especially with our trauma horses, there is a lot of rewiring there that takes quite a lot of time. So, um, Charlie, with your question, with like regards to riding a horse that's experienced trauma, you can get to a really good place on the ground but there's a big process to take that into the saddle again. So we're looking at, um, you know, those same relaxation cues just when we're standing on the mounting block. We're looking at those same relaxation cues just like kind of leaning over the horse. Like it's a really big process of getting into the saddle um, because if you feel any tension or fear, then they will be triggered instantaneously and so we have to be able to get ourselves to soften and relax into the saddle and we have to get our horses to soften and relax and allow us into the saddle so what connection looks like in the saddle there's a couple of things is we're looking for um, our horse knows how to communicate through bit pressure by, by the way that they put their mouth into our hands um, our horse has to accept them in accept us into their back so their back like softens and it allows us into them um and then we're developing our relaxation in the saddle as well so we're going to do stand with our relaxation cues and we're just going to keep unwinding our horse back into state of relaxation we can't ever say we're not fixing our horse we can't ever say that our horses are fixed they are who they are and we're learning how to work with them. Um, you know, the thing that you're trying to fix is their personality. We can't fix their personality. We can hear how their personality is trying to communicate to you and we can support that and we can then de-escalate. But if we have that pressure on ourselves and we put that pressure onto them of trying to achieve goals without listening, to how they need to be supported to reach those goals, we can end up rushing and skipping required steps that they need for the psychological safety. And then that's when we're gonna end up with the same problems in the saddle, is we have to have the same level of listening and hearing them in the saddle as we had on the ground so that we can build that psychological safety. So that if they are starting to think 
about bucking or bolting or, you know, they're like, oh, I'm really feeling the pressure here, like this is too much. You know, we we should have had that and stopped and hopped off before we got to that point, but then can we get that to relaxation? And, you know, quite often we'll get told that we're going to make naughty horses that are dangerous and so we're going to try and push them and rush them through that tension where we really need to be coming back and consolidating our relaxation. Can you keep your horse out of fight, flight or freeze? with you sitting on their back doing nothing? Can you keep them out of there while you're walking? Can you keep them out of that point when, you know, you're doing anything with them? And so our communication in the saddle becomes like cueing through bit pressure. So we do a lot of in-hand work first and um, relaxation in the saddle. So we do a lot of that relaxation process and then it does become how are they using their body and how are they using themselves so that they can carry us in a way that doesn't hurt them? Yeah. I think, um, like, we have a program um, at the moment that um, we call the Confident Trailblazer program, which isn't um, yet open to enrolment because the foundation skills are found inside our holistic handling program. But that's where we take all of the skills that we teach our students on the ground to start applying them into the saddle to develop that level of feel to help our horses accept us in the saddle to develop confidence in the aids that we develop and to to teach you guys also like our students how to use those aids step by step and build them up in those initial um, phases or all the way through any of the riding courses that we do have so that we can um, we always have the foundations and something uh, foundations there so when we level up we've got something to go back down to so um, there's some really great um, like programs that we do have put together to help and support our students through this and and there's a number of our students so for example Pam um, Pam and Tanya who are on live tonight they've um, so Pam's been through to our um, advanced writing course um, Tanya's been through into our um, uh, our first version of the confident trailblazer which is about to be um expanded as well and all of that all of these advanced riding courses they start with the holistic horse handling program so um i did remember that someone did email me a couple of days ago and i did mention that i was going to um open it up but anybody who is interested the holistic horse handling program can be found at equestriummovement.com forward slash holistic horse handling um, we have opened it up to new students um, and it's going to be open for enrolment until Tuesday next week. So we only open it for a limited time. The reason we open it for a limited time to accept new students in is to help you guys, uh, to support you guys through that initial induction phase. And we do have this really strong community. So you will find the likes of Pam and Tanya inside that community, plus a number of our other students inside um, uh, the community, which is called the Arena Classroom, which is exclusively for the students of um, our programs. And we can check in and ask questions. And, um, you know, if there's something that's a little bit more, um, like something that's not quite clear, or maybe we just need to expand on it based on a particular personality or experience that someone's um, doing, we've often created either a little additional mini training session or even just answered questions inside that group. Um, so, you know, that is the um, great thing with our um, holistic horse handling um, program. And it's one of those where if you buy it, it's yours for life. So you can keep going back and using those skills and you're in the community for life. So regardless of whether you've got one horse or 10 horses that you're working with, you can keep coming back to it and looking at um, exactly what your um, horse needs and then tailoring it to each individual horse. And then when you're feeling a little bit stuck, ask the community. You've got Katie inside the group. So she's our head coach. She'll be supporting all of our students through that. Um, I'm also in there um, helping to support there as well. And I'm also there for the tech support, which sometimes is needed because, um, you know, know, that we're not always, you know, we like to work with horses. We, not, we, we didn't get an IT degree. We, we like to work with horses. So sometimes we just need that little bit of extra support to find things in it. Um, uh, on the website or um, those types of things. We're always there to help you guys. And then you've got this really resounding, great group of students who have been in the exact same situation that you guys have, have experienced it all, who can share their own experiences. <laughs> um, share their own experiences 
um, and what they've learned and taken away and the tips and tricks that they found as well. And the great thing about the holistic horse handling program as well that I think um, is really cool and one of our um, students has recently undergone this is we don't just go, this is the groundwork to create a safe, secure horse. This is also the groundwork skills that you're going to take and use in every single day handling, which is, um, I think, uh, one of the things that we need to really think about because every time we interact with our horse, we need to be practising these skill sets in some way, shape or form. We need to be looking at, um, you know, can, am I asking my horse to be in a working brain right now or a relaxed brain right now? Um, is this something that's going to be worrying and fearful for them? Um, should I be queuing for some level of relaxation? Um, do I have communication? Do I have consent? And this is where it comes to things like grooming and um, handling from body workers and barriers and veterinarians and, and medicating. So one of our students um, who have gone through it, um, they, uh, like I, I've put together um, this like we've put together this lesson which talks about how to use paste medications without creating fear and anxiety associated with it and this particular student um he has a i think it, i want to say gypsy cob and the gypsy cob would hightail it to the other end of the stable slash paddock if she ever saw you come out with a paste and now she will and then of course incidentally has come up with ulcers so she's getting pasted every single day and she loves it now, like the whole process of going through that and understanding the handling and understanding what our horse needs for us to accept that, yeah, okay, medicating is not necessarily going to be the most pleasant thing that they experience, but it's not a scary situation. We can handle it um, and we're not doing anything that's going to help or harm you. In fact, we're trying to help you. Um, so this horse now comes up and actually willingly takes the syringe in her mouth so that she can get her taste and her love and her affection um, in there as well. So that's where the holistic horse handling program um, sort of sits. We take it not just the basic groundworks and skill sets, but also into how to apply that into your everyday husbandry. Um, and we are expanding it to include that newer segment around our horses that have, uh, I guess, more reactivity where they're more either traumatized or more on that aggressive spectrum of personalities where they're more, they're happier to take you out with them. Um, you know, two back feet or a shoulder barge or something that's a little bit more um, dangerous. So we're just currently expanding that um, in there as well so that we've got additional skill sets to support our students for those. So we are expecting that to be completed in the next two weeks, which is pretty exciting, right, Katie? <laughs> oh, no, two weeks? Was that my time frame? <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, only, it's only five new lessons. <laughs> 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 um, actually, I think it's only three new lessons. We just need a couple of extra videos for some of them. That's all. But um, yeah, so we're 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 definitely working on that. So if you are interested and you want you uh, want to learn more about the holistic horse handling program, you can jump onto that website, which we've got up on the screen. Um, but if you uh, do have questions, you know, you want to figure out if it's the right fit for you, by all means, reach over, uh, reach out and chat to me or Katie, and we can um, walk through, you know, your specific requirements and let you know um, how we can help you inside that too. So, um, but that's initially what we talked about. So the first hour and a half that we've just spoken about, we've just gotten past our circles. <laughs> We haven't um, taught those circles before. That was fun. I really liked yeah, it. Yeah, I know. I know. It's it's um like we've been doing this for a very long time, and and uh, a number of students who've joined us, or a number of people who've joined us for stronger bond workshops previously, would know that it's a very new section for us, and it's all about sort of encompassing the the idea of that um, connection based training. Um, that is um, going to create these um, the psychological safety with us and the horse that is going to lead to the end result of those unicorn moments and the building of confidence and all the rest, which is actually going to lead us into the next section. So I might go through this a little bit quicker because I know that we're now at about an hour and a half <laughs> into it. Um, but it's like, why should we work as part of a powerfully connected team? And it's really like there's a couple of key things and these are huge big learnings that I've taken away from it as well. But number one is that it helps develop your own confidence in working with your horse. Um, the idea of this program is that it's um, small, easy wins that are achievable to give that dopamine hit 
um, to the horse, but it also gives us the same hit as well. So as we are working on those small wins and getting more and more wins, we're actually going to see our own confidence develop and grow and we're going to level up that much easier. Um, we're also going to feel less of that anxiety and worry as to whether or not we're doing the right thing because we're actually going to identify that our horse is enjoying the work that we're doing um, and that we're getting those um, those uh, wins easily. I think the time when we start really having anxiety and doubting that things are going wrong is because we are putting too much pressure on ourselves to achieve too much and we need to remember that sometimes just those little wins nail it for us and give us just as much confidence as it does the horses as well. Um, so our number two is um, that it also gives your horse confidence in you as a leader that's worth following. So that means that the horse can start to let down some of the barriers that they may have built up, start to open up some of the communication in a, a much more subtle way as in, and I talk about more subtle way in that we're not talking about the big, loud, scarier, bolder behaviours. It's um, asking for rather than demanding that you listen or trying to um, create attention to what they're, they're trying to say. Um, and that's um, all about the compassionate leadership and developing our horse's emotional agility. Number three is it's about giving your horse the ability to recognise, uh, so about giving you the ability to recognise and support your horse through moments of conflict because those conflict moments are going to crop up from time to time um, depending on the horse, depending on the scenario, depending on their ex past history, depending on your, um, you know, how you come down. Like if you come down to Biddy's paddock with um, resting bitch face, you can bet you <laughs> your bottom dollar that he is going to tell you to chuff off out of the paddock. But um, I also know that the work that Katie has done has allowed me to go in um, to help um, with regards to medicating one of the school horses that were, was kept in his paddock. And he was actually really soft and affectionate because I knew that you couldn't take a particular work ethic down there with him, but you also had to ask for some level of consent with him as well before we could touch. And so he was just this huge sweetie pie. He actually helped me um, not fall in the mud at one stage, which was really cute. <laughs> Different books. It was very weird. <laughs> um, so, you know, having those skill sets so that you can identify when crises may hit um, and that your horse can tell you when they're feeling that level of crisis and you can identify when your horse is telling you that and then you've got these skill sets that you can go back down to. And then number four is that it creates a horse that wants to look after you and be with you. So this is part about the um, willingness and also the connection. And the, um, all of that builds into this huge psychological safety and it's about being this powerfully connected equestrian team. So that is the second question. Uh, so finally, we've got some bonus tips. We've briefly touched on these, but this is Katie's favourite part of the Stronger Bond um, <laughs> Stronger Bond workshop, which is love language for our ponies, knowing our horse's love language, <laughs> as we like to call it, emotional motivators. <laughs> this is a um, topic that Sarah and I thought was incredibly funny when we first started <laughs> talking about it. Um, it was like the figuring out your love language with your your partner and whether you um if you guys don't have the same love language you kind of end up with friction because your partner might be showing you that they love you through gifts but you receive love through um I don't even remember what the human love languages are but <laughs> if your way of receiving love language is different to your partner's way of receiving love language of receiving love then um, you end up with the friction because you feel like you're not loved because it's you're not being showed it in the way that you receive it. Yeah. And so this is what we talk about with the horses. And, you know, quite often we use food. So I think your mic's muted, Katie. I think. Yeah, um, but just to give you context on that human one where you were trying to think of the difference, like um, there's some people who like to show affection and, and love by gift giving, so giving people things. They like to give you something. So it could be 
Um, you know, it could be buying you gifts, it could be buying you lunch, it could be feeding you. And then there's others that really thrive on touch, for example. Um, so if you are with your partner and your partner is a person that um, likes to be touched to know that there's affection, but you're the type of person that likes to give things, so you're just constantly throwing things at them, they're not going to get that touch that they need and crave. <laughs> um, so they don't feel that level of love and affection. Um, and if um, you don't get those gifts, you assume your partner doesn't love you just as much, even though they might be very touchy-feely with you. And the same thing relates to our horses. Yeah. So we talk about our food as like our entry-level emotional motivator. Most horses are motivated food. Some horses more so than others. And obviously we're looking at managing the level of excitement and motivation associated with the food so that it doesn't escalate to frisking and um you know hassling you for treats and whatnot but food is a great way of bringing walls down and starting to build that trust in us and the confidence in us it's you know zodi is the um horse i have at the moment that has experienced trauma and this is how we establish connection in the first place physical connection so he was so scared of me that he would come nowhere near me in the paddock actually. I did need to be able to catch him so that the farrier could do him and so that we could brush him and the vet could handle him and that kind of thing. So the way that we used food in the beginning was purely that, like, um, you know, we can use positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement when we understand the tools. So negative reinforcement is the thing that they don't want goes away when they do what we want and positive reinforcement is that they receive the thing that they do want when they do what we're asking them to do so when i was asking him to approach me in the paddock I, it was at feed time and so i would stand until like as far as he would come to approach me then i'd put the feed down and i'd walk out so he could control where i was and my proximity to him by telling me when he was as close as he was comfortable with and then I would leave and so we did that over a week until we got to the point where he was close enough to touch my hand and so I'd hold my hand out while holding the feed bucket and uh, wait for him to touch my hand for me to feed down and walk out so this is what um, we, we're talking about when we understand our horses with their unique person is I know that he chooses flight when feeling threatened over fight. So this is not a good tactic for developing emotional move, like our emotional movies and our love language with our horse. Have a horse that is bullying you for feed or is more aggressive around feed and that kind of thing. So it's really understanding how feed motivates your horse emotionally and how you're going to use it in your training to reinforce the different behaviors that you're looking for from your horse the way that i use it with fitty is very different um so i go to your mic is muted again sorry i think it's tired <laughs> wants to go to bed <laughs> No. There we go. Got it. Yeah. StreamYard doesn't like me. So the way that I use it with Fiddy is very different. We use it to set boundaries instead. So, uh, um, you know, who will chase and bully for the food is I go to the fence and I ask him away from and I don't enter the paddock until he's walking away from me and he has to keep walking away from me until I put the feet down and say okay and then he's allowed to walk towards me so the way that you use your feed and food time feed time routine and then your treats is really helpful for how you can either set boundaries or um, encourage connection and, and quality connection we do the same with the schoolies so like our lower less motivated lower work ethic horses get do get a bit more treats <laughs> to help motivate them and engage them in learning they want that physical reward uh, but our higher energy horses just get a bit like they lose a bit of focus and concentration in trying to get the treats so we will do more praise and pat based rewards rather than treats until you know if they're really starting 
to just get sick of looking after beginners, <laughs> then we might start using a little bit of treats there to try and re-engage them in, in their learning or we would spell them. So that brings us to the second one, which is physical contact. We've already talked about that a little bit, but um, you know, how can you pat your horse? How can you touch your horse? How can you scratch your horse in a way that they soften into you, you see the relaxation because they enjoy your presence. And, you know, some of our horses that really have those walls up, so Fiddy is one of them, they really don't like being groomed, they don't like touch, they don't like being patted. So part of that physical contact is like as the walls come, they do get more comfortable with us touching them and, and patting them. So I actually had a moment with Zodi the other day Normally he's so scared that like I can get maybe to his shoulder before he gets uncomfortable. And he, and I just like run my hand down his body where I'm working with him just to increase his comfort levels with us moving around him. And he let me go the whole way around him to his bum. And I had my hand on his bum as I was standing right in behind him. And that is a really big sign of trust in a horse because that's their place of vulnerability so um, they can't see directly behind them and that's where they'll put their herd and their paddock mates um, for them to go to sleep so the fact that he was letting me into that space when he's been so wary of me even going down his body is like a huge um, sign of acceptance and since then he is actually been even more engaged in approaching me and wanting to do things with me. So we see like, uh, it's like the Shrek and the onion peel, right? Like these little layers of trust, um, trust broken fall away. And then we're trying to build like little relationship bonds of trust um, where it's been broken previously. And where this goes wrong is if we overface or we ask too much of our horse and we create those like little micro tears in the quality of the trust, faith and confidence and the connection, then, um, you know, the walls kind of start coming up. And depending on the horse, the walls can come up really quickly and defensively or they can just be like, starting to not give you contact anymore, starting to just like hold themselves a little bit stiff when you want to approach them, starting to like look away if you're trying to ask some things of them. So that's also part of getting to, to know your horse is do they like physical contact? Where do they like it? Do they soften into you? Um, and, you know, what parts of their body do they let you touch? When do they show you, like, they get the lip going, like, oh, yeah, scratch me there. That's so good. <laughs> Which is our favourite, <laughs> favourite one. And so, um, you know, we know that grooming is a love language between horses. Um, they'll groom each other when they like each other. And you, you see the horses that don't really like each other very much just, like, barely give physical contact at all so it is a very strong one particularly um in over top of the wither so if you can get the acceptance of them touching you wither and really get into that point and also the the is stroking they really like that one too so vocals is another one of our emotional motivators we mo most of us will have experienced um the halt as a result of saying good <laughs> working your horse and you go say great like good job good good boy good girl and they just like stop instantly <laughs> uh, oh yes i was a good boy did you see me there i was a good girl i did great work <laughs> um praise is one that i encourage a lot particularly in the saddle as well because like we're not going to be using treats up there and sometimes um scratching and patting can interfere with the communication and the contact but every single time you ask something of your horse, you need to say, yes, thank you. That was good. That was it. That was what I wanted. So if you're like using your legs to tell them to go and then you don't say yes and like, yes, thank you and give them a little scratch or give them a yes at least, how do they know that that is what you've actually wanted them to do? Yes, we can have the release of pressure and we stop kicking, but then how many of us also nag to keep our horses going? 
So the vocals are so important for marking the behavior. And they also do get, like, if they associate the positive reinforcement with the vocal, then um, we get a dopamine release for it as well. So it's um, going to motivate them emotionally. That's one of our strongest tools for developing a good work ethic as well as our breaks that we give our horses within the training session. Um, but it's also, like... Just so that they know that we like them. <laughs> you know, the tone, they, they know the tone of our voice. And if we can use our vocals in a way that, you know, shows our affection towards us, it is a way of getting them to soften in as well. Uh, and then lastly, socialization. Um, so there's a lot wrong. <laughs> with the equestrian industry and, and how we do horses um horses are social animals they live in herds and they create social bonds and a lot of the situations that we put them into mean that they don't get to fully express um, their socialization hormones and so then we end up with uh, behavioral disorders like cribbing um, and wind sucking and uh, just like bite things like weaving you know the different uh, expressions of that anxiety and that tension and that isolation that comes up when they don't get to fully express and metabolize their socialization hormones um if like when when we're trying to socialize with our horses we can't even allow them to fully express their socialization hormones on us because it's dangerous to us for them to fully horse under our watch <laughs> you can be full horse but just go do it over there <laughs> Uh, when we're developing our socialization with our horses, we are setting boundaries and parameters. We can't have them running up at us and rearing and striking out in play. Um, we can't have them running up and buying us up on the bum and running away. So um, it is a lot easier to socialize with the older horses because like their version of socialization is hanging out under the tree and relaxing. <laughs> and so we can go in and read a book with them and just hang out and spend some time together. But, um, you know, things that I do with Fiddy is I make a cup of camel tea for me and him and I'll go down and sit with him and he'll drink out of his cup while I drink out of my cup. Um, just like going down and hanging out with them in the paddock, spending time, that time is low pressure. It's such a strong connection and relationship and bond builder because we're it's like we're getting into the relaxation hormones. They're feeling safe to relax around us. They're feeling safe to go to sleep around us. They're feeling like we're not pressuring, you know, you go down, catch your horse, tuck them up, ride. Go down, grab your horse, tuck them up, ride. Go down, take your horse, ride them. We're constantly putting this performance pressure on them. Then they don't ever get the opportunity to relax and enjoy us. So actively creating time to just be with our horse as part of our training sessions it should be high priority because our horses only know us if we're, if we're time pressured and stressed and pushing them to work if we do it any other way. So we need our horses to know who we are when we're relaxed and we're happy and we are enjoying them just as much as we want them to enjoy us. I think that's incredibly important and that's why we love these emotional motivators is knowing the ones that work best with your horse and then being able to use them as part of the different processes where we may be working with them. But it gives us a chance to really allow um, ourselves to get and to develop that deeper connection as well, particularly that socialising. I love I love grabbing Gunner either before or after a session and we might have a couple of um, games where we do training. Like uh, yesterday I taught him to kiss, um, so I'd ask him to and he'd just put his nose on my nose <laughs> and, and we put kiss, kiss. And that's like fun games that we do together. But then we were, you know, I would take him, like, you know, bringing him up to the yard 
um, rather than just bringing him straight up to the stable and grooming him up, knowing that we had, you know, saddle fitter and a little ride planned and that kind of thing. I would uh, like, I love taking him just for a little bit of a wander around the paddocks for a bit of a graze and a sniff of everybody else's poos and, you know, and just having a little bit of fun um, together exploring. And it's just like, it's, it's low pressure exploration with no demand on each other to be in a particular place at a particular time. So I do love the socialization, even if, um, you know, food contact and vocals are a lot of the ones we use in general training. The socialization I think is the one that really helps with some of that connection um, building as well. Yeah, I have a lot of kids that come in um, really scared of horses as well. And, you know, they the horses know that you're scared of them. They see the fear. They feel it. They see it in the way that you hold themselves. And so just even in then that, like, if I have, you know, a kid coming in for their first lesson, I can tell they're a bit nervous. Or if, um, you know, it doesn't even have to be their first lesson. One of my students was really scared of the horse and just kept coming back. So we were doing this together for eight months before she'd hop on the horse where, you know, I get her to put her arm underneath Angel's neck and um, press her nose into her neck and smell her. And I tell her to breathe her in and smell her and breathe her all the way into her heart. And she had to picture Angel sitting in her heart <laughs> and make a little heart space for Angel. And she'd have to do it. And I'd say, can you go deeper? Can you go deeper? Can you go deeper? Getting her to just keep like smelling her and breathing her in as deep as she could into her lungs until um, I started to see like Angel let go of some tension and give us some some relaxation cues and this was a big one that Jane had to work on with me with Fiddy was because like the way <laughs> that he is I just find so annoying <laughs> so <laughs> she was like Katie you just need to like go in with an open heart like oh just I hate that hope and heart like can't I just have a tool that makes it easier <laughs> to do like just do some training and we'll make him do what I want him to do but it is like um the game changer for us is um you know having to really visually think about what loving him would look like and feel like and like to really focus on loving him because he was annoying me so much and so I'd, I'd have to stand up at the bar and at the feed room and just like really actively what does love for fitty look like and slowly and slowly and slowly I could like oh, okay I love you <laughs> And so getting myself into that brain space where I was actually loving him and not just going, oh, I have to go down and work with my horse or feed my horse or whatever, just that, you know, it, it plays such a big role in how we are received by our horses. And even in that, like when I'm doing the beginner lessons and I'm like, oh, like I'm starting to see the horses get annoyed or frustrated, like you can see it in my shoulders already. Oh, the horses are starting to get a bit annoyed with that rider, but it's a beginner, so it's not going to get any better. If I go, okay, I can feel my shoulders getting tense and drop them and just like take that breath myself and release that tension, the horses do it straight away as well. We really underestimate the impact that the way that we hold tension and we breathe, how much impact that has on our horses on the ground and in the saddle. Like when we do it in our in the saddle, our legs start to clamp on, our lower back gets tightened, our like seat is kind of tightens out and away from the horse and we kind of like tip forward a little bit and then we brace down and we lock on their mouths. Like these are all ways where we're feeling the friction and it's playing out in our tension, which is creating more tension, which creates more friction, which creates more tension. If we can pick up on our tension as it's building and go, oh, okay, let it all out, let it all go, Ooh, take that moment, step out, and then come back in. Um, our horses will do it with us and they will let go of their friction and their frustration with us and you know we just keep coming together and trying to find that place of togetherness where we're both in, enjoying each other. Yeah I love it. 
Oh, we could go on forever. And um, clearly we yeah. have. <laughs> Um, so this session is slightly longer than we anticipated, but uh, you know it is a really good, good session. It's um, the first time we've done it, so we might uh, look at whether or not we need to change it up or not, but that's okay. Um, but this is the end of the actual Stronger Bond workshop component itself. Um, so thank you guys very much for persevering with us and um, hanging out with us for the last three nights. It's been great. Um, helping you guys to, I guess, recognise where we sit at the moment where that conflict and friction can really impact our connection and why we might be feeling that conflict and connection. And hopefully tonight's session has given you a really deeper understanding of how we can change um, that process by addressing just a few key areas um, and skill sets and um, knowledge base and then just even, even thought processes around how we work with our horse to take that conflict and change it into this powerfully powerful connection where we can work as a true unit, as that truly connected team and have those unicorn moments where our horse has faith, trust and confidence in us and we have faith, trust and confidence in our horse as well. So... Um, we will announce in the Facebook group um, if slash when there will be a Q&A session, but if there's any more questions, please feel free to keep posting in the, uh, in the group. Do remember that the replays are only available until um, Sunday next week. Um, and this one's probably going to be a great one to, um, you know, sit down and listen to again. So please do if you feel it. And there's only one last chore that we have left to, to announce, Katie. One last thing. <laughs> uh, which is um, I want to I, I, I've got winner winner chicken dinner stuck in my head I don't know why <laughs> maybe it's because it's nearly 10 o'clock at night in Queensland <laughs> um, but anyway it's the winners of the um, uh, the giveaways of the opening communication mini course so uh, we'd like to say a very um, big thank you for Char to Charlie and Jenny for joining us and uh, commenting and sending your messages through and participating in the action items. Um, I will send you a direct message probably in about half an hour's time once I have a little bit of an unwind because I always get a bit G'd up during these um, sessions. So I just need a little breather. Um, I'll send you a direct message just to um, give you some insight into how we can sign you up for that. But congratulations, thank you so, so much. And um, you know, any questions, feel free to send them through. All right, um, don't forget there is an action item for tonight as well. I'm not actually going to post it in the Facebook group uh, because what I want you guys to do is to give yourself permission to be the person your horse needs. Um, that's the main thing I want you guys to take away from these sessions. Give yourself permission to be the person that your horse needs and give your horse the permission to be the horse that he or she needs to be as well. So, um, you know, think about the things that you might need to do to step up and change that if you need to or, um, you know, if you have any questions or you want any additional support, feel free to reach out to us directly. In the meantime, it's been great hosting you guys. I am so um, thrilled to be able to do these Stronger Bond workshops again, and we look forward to seeing you in other trainings in the future. Thank you. Bye.